Hi everyone and welcome, this is The Apostate Prophet. It's been a while. I feel glad to be back. I feel glad that I can finally sit here and bash the religious beliefs of 1.6 billion people again, who just want to believe in God. Or do they? What do you think about cults? You know, those groups of weirdos where a charismatic leader makes huge promises to his followers that he can never prove. And his followers love him so much for some reason and do everything for him. Those groups where the leader claims to possess the only truth, the absolute truth from somewhere up above. And everything else outside is false and harmful, dangerous, forbidden, bad. You just need to trust him. And that leader also has special rights that only he has. Like numerous women, little girls. He has those rights because he has his big divine guy who favors him, not you. And you better don't object. We have many such cults in our time. Usually only those who are inside the cult don't realize that they are a cult. They usually say, we, we are not a cult. Others are, but, but not us. Why would you think we were a cult? The general public, the rest of us, we usually don't like these cults. They have strange, weird beliefs and practices. We think of them as weird and funny. We just want them to stay away from us. That's very ironic, because it looks like we only treat cults that way because they have a very small number of followers. When they have a much higher number of followers, they seem more reasonable to us, and the average person suddenly treats them like something normal. Well, to be fair, no one likes Islam. Islam should be on number one, on a list of cults that have gone way too far. It is similar to Jonestown, where a guy called Jim Jones promised his followers paradise through all kinds of repression, and the 900 members committed mass suicide on his orders. In Muhammad's case, they just started killing others instead of killing themselves. Anyways, the point is, Islam has very cult-like features. And I want to talk about the cult of Muhammad. There are many ways in which Muhammad was a cult leader in 7th century Arabia, long before it became a world religion through endless campaigns of war to spread the religion of peace to everyone because this guy in Arabia said so. Now, one problem we have is that when you raise criticism against a cult, the cult members often take those bad things and sugarcoat them. They can offer an excuse for basically everything you said, even when it seems impossible. And the same thing goes for Islam. But still, here is what I did. I sat down just for a few minutes and thought of as many cult-like qualities of Muhammad and his religion Islam as I could. And I included the most important ones. And if you think this list is incomplete, then you are free to add your suggestions to the comment section. I'm very excited to see all the cult qualities of Islam and Muhammad. So here goes. The first one is very obvious to me. The pledge. In order to become a Muslim, you have to say a phrase. The phrase that makes you part of Islam includes already something about Muhammad. It goes, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So when you enter Islam, in order to become a Muslim, you are not only supposed to accept that Allah is your God, you are also forced to accept Muhammad as the messenger. Muslims often don't think about this because this is the religion they grow up with. This is how they are indoctrinated. But Abrahamic religion doesn't have such a concept. In Abrahamic religion, it wasn't a thing that you take a prophet and acknowledge his name in order to be part of this religion. You are normally only supposed to believe in God and follow his commandments. This concept that you have to respect and love this specific figure, that's completely Islamic. As a Christian or a Jew, you are not supposed to have complete devotion and love for Moses and Abraham and say their names all the time and think about them all the time, and listen to them all the time. They are just people who led the Jews, who informed them about God, who told them about God's message. That is their function. And God communicates with them and guides them. That's it. In Islam, you are suddenly supposed to take this second character beside God. None of that has any basis in Abrahamic religion. Islam teaches you that all the biblical prophets are recognized and that Allah loves them all and they are all favored. But it also teaches you that Muhammad is superior to all of them. Muhammad is Allah's favorite. This again has no biblical basis. Some Islamic schools and movements go so far with this that they claim Allah created everything 
for Muhammad. He created the world and humans just for the sake of Muhammad. That's how crazy this behavior goes. In Islam, you're supposed to send peace and blessings upon Muhammad all the time. You know, this annoying thing that happens when Muslim apologists or Muslims in general talk, and all the time when Muhammad is mentioned, they go, peace be upon him, peace and blessings be upon him. Let's just have a conversation without being weird. Islam does not only teach that you are supposed to, forced to, send peace and blessings upon Muhammad because Muhammad condemns you otherwise, and this point should already kill it. Islam also teaches that the angels send peace and blessings upon Muhammad day and night, and that even Allah, the creator of the universe, that in all his business he sends peace and blessings upon Muhammad all the time. That's how important Muhammad is. This is a cult. According to Islam, everyone who rejects Muhammad as messenger burns in hell. You're supposed to accept him. Accepting him is your way to salvation, to heaven. And this is a reminder, Muhammad is just supposed to be a single man, a prophet, not a god or anything. Those Christians and Jews were rightful people until they rejected Muhammad, for which they will burn eternally. You are supposed to imitate Muhammad and do everything that he did. Religious Muslims have a long list of all the things that you can and can't do because of Muhammad. And there we thought Abrahamic religion was supposed to be the belief in God. According to Islam, you are never to doubt what Muhammad brings you. You are supposed to accept everything he says because he is guided. He has the truth and you are to obey him. The Quran makes clear that only if you obey him and make him a judge over every matter, then you are a true believer, not just if you believe in Allah. Muhammad claims that Allah talks to him, only to him. Allah talks to him through an angel who brings these divine revelations to him. But no one else knows of this angel. No one else sees this angel or has a conversation with this angel. No one has any proof of any of that at all. These revelations are also very weird, because Muhammad has an answer for everything. Unlike the Bible, which is a mass collection of prophets who wrote down texts, the Quran is supposed to be a book where Allah immediately reveals laws to Muhammad in the moment whenever Muhammad needs something. We have dozens, hundreds of cases in the Hadith, where someone comes and asks Muhammad something that he doesn't know, and then Muhammad goes into a mode of trance and suddenly says, okay, Allah just said this and this to me. Like telling his hesitant followers that they can have sex with female captives of war. Or he's in a room with people and says that everyone needs to fight for Allah. But a disabled person in the back says, but I can't fight. And then suddenly there comes another revelation where Allah suddenly says, well, except those who are not capable. Or there is a very notorious incident where he marries the wife of his adopted son after he divorces her. Of course, the masses go crazy and think, what the hell is going on? You can't just marry the ex-wife of your adopted son. And he says, hey, calm down. Allah allowed me to do this. And you all, even herself, don't have any say in this. This is how we do it from now on. This holy prophet Muhammad is also a very special leader who deserves the best wives, of course. Which is why there are numerous incidents where he receives and distributes women among his believers, and he picks the best one for himself, either as a slave or as a wife. He also goes around asking for more and more women, even after he already has a dozen women. Speaking of, the regular Muslim man is only allowed to have a maximum of four wives, which is already something crazy. But not Muhammad. Muhammad is not bound by those rules for the common people. Muhammad had 11 wives at the same time, because he could do whatever he wants to do, because he's the holy prophet and Allah loves him. There even is a special verse in the Quran which says that matters of sex where Muhammad can just pick and lay aside whomever he wants are only for him and not for the Muslims, because Muhammad is special. This is only for you, not for the rest of the believers. We certainly know what we have made obligatory upon them concerning their wives and their slaves. But this is only for you, so that there is no discomfort upon you. Quran 3350 How can you read this and still believe this is such a beautiful religion? 
Mohammed even had a taste for children, where in two occasions he picked children as possible future wives. He married one of them when she was only six years old, and consummated the marriage as in having sex with her when she was nine. And since Mohammed is supposed to be the best example for all humankind, the most moral character in human history, even today's Muslims don't have a problem with that. I love how so many of these Islamophobes don't have the ability to represent me fairly by calling this child rape. How is it child rape when there is parental consent? Did I mention sex slaves? I probably did. Oh, how would a cult leader convince his followers that he is the absolute truth and that you must definitely follow him, even if you have doubts. I don't know, but if you are in 7th century Arabia, you probably tell your hungry followers that they will receive beautiful virgins with big breasts in heaven and big eyes and transparent skin. Uh, <laughs> this one always gets me. Muhammad was so weird that he implemented very crazy rulings based on what seems to be his impulses. He obviously didn't like dogs. He had a problem with dogs. And dogs are forbidden to keep in the house. Seriously, one of the best things that happened after I left Islam was that I got a dog. A woman came to the prophet and said, My daughter is going to get married, and she has had the measles and her hair has fallen out. Can I put extensions in her hair? The Messenger of Allah said, Allah has cursed the one who does hair extensions and the one who has that done. Okay, Mohammed. <laughs> oh, Islam has a big problem with all those who reject Mohammed's true message that he could have just peacefully delivered to everyone. Islam especially has a problem with a specific religious group that proved to be extremely difficult in accepting Mohammed as a legitimate prophet, the Jews. I will just put this one down as F the Jews. It is also very common in Islamic culture, in Islam in general, that people who don't believe in Islam have a tag, the disbeliever, disbelievers, the kafir. It is a derogatory term that Islam casually applies to everyone who rejects the message. And it basically translates to something like someone who hides the truth. So Islam even accuses you of wrongdoings just because you exist. It is very normal among cults that outsiders are called outsiders, the ignorant ones, the general population. But it is especially common that if you leave the cult, then that leaving has severe consequences. You can be persecuted, you are shunned. In some crazy or powerful cults, you are killed if you leave and silenced. Very similar in Islam, where someone who leaves Islam is called a murtad, an apostate, and he deserves to be killed. You are not supposed to like him and continue your friendship with them. This killing, of course, is done very easily because in Islam you're supposed to kill and die for Muhammad. You're not only supposed to go and kill his enemies and destroy those places that he wants you to destroy, you're even supposed to kill his enemies without him telling you. There was a specific guy called Abdullah ibn Sa'd in Muhammad's time. This was a writer for Muhammad. At some point he stopped believing in Muhammad's message because he thought, wait a minute, Muhammad just changes the things that he says on his own will. That doesn't sound right. Well, after Muhammad conquered Mecca and this guy was there, he was brought to Muhammad so that he could become a Muslim again and pledge allegiance to Muhammad, which was obligatory. See what happened. On the day of the conquest of Mecca, Abdullah ibn Sa'd ibn Abu Sart hid himself with Uthman ibn Affan. He brought him and made him stand before the Prophet and said, Accept the allegiance of Abdullah, Messenger of Allah. He raised his head and looked at him three times, refusing him each time but accepted his allegiance after the third time. Then, returning to his companions, he said, Was not there a wise man among you who would stand up to him when he saw that I had withheld my hand from accepting his allegiance and kill him? They said, uh, We did not know what you had in your heart, Messenger of Allah. Why did you not give us a sign with your eye so we could have killed him? He said, it is not advisable for a prophet to play deceptive tricks with his eyes. So it's inappropriate for a prophet to, to, to make these signs like, kill him. But his followers are just supposed to understand what he wants without those signs and just kill that guy. Muslims, what?
Of course, we won't stop at killing those people. It was also common to kill all those critics of Muhammad, just for criticizing Muhammad, for insulting Muhammad. And that tradition still lives on today, as we have all repeatedly seen, again and again and again. And there is one final thing that I want to mention. According to Islam, Muhammad is the final prophet. He is the final prophet. There is no prophet after him. You are only to accept him and he will lead you to heaven and no one else. Everyone who comes after him and tries to be a prophet is going to be killed. And that's what happened after Muhammad died. This has no basis in Abrahamic religion at all. There is no concept of a final prophet. Based on all of this, let's just say it as it is. Islam doesn't ask you to believe in one God. It tells you to believe in one God, Allah, and in his messenger, Muhammad. It is ironic. The Quran accuses the Christians and Jews of taking their priests as gods. But Islam, which seems like it was created by Muhammad and his companions, basically turns Muhammad into a god. A mere human, a prophet, whose words are so authoritative that Islam consists of more Muhammad traditions, more laws based on Muhammad's actions and words, than on Quranic laws. What is this, if not a deification of Muhammad? Christians see Jesus as God, and not even in their faith. Does Jesus have such authority on what you can and can't do throughout your day? On how you should and should not poop? In Islam, an illiterate guy grew from a rebel against his local traditions and beliefs into a cult leader who successfully built an empire based on his personal desires. How is this religion any different from cults in our time? that are just meant to follow a crazy person who seems to have mental issues. Mental health is a good topic, by the way. I will talk about Muhammad's mental health. For now, thanks for watching. Most of my videos are not monetized, so you can watch everything without ads. If you want to support me and what I'm doing, you can support me on Patreon. I appreciate all your support so much. I will be back very soon. Have a great day and stay away from Islam.